Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Okay, I'm ready. <clears throat> People still coming in. All right. So, um, due to popular request, I tried to side sway, swipe, side step it. Uh, we're going to deal with lust today. Um, but <clears throat> before we jump into that, we need to step back a little and um, look at uh the common what we what we've derived so far right so we can then see that lust is actually uh in the same kind of sensory motor cycle but it's it's got some uh uh really cool features to it so um <clears throat> i want to sort of start off by talking about the relationship between affect perception and action they kind of mentioned this over the course of the last two weeks but we're just trying to summarize it here and that is that affect is an intentional motivational state. It could be sometimes it's called a mood or, you know, it's just it's it primes you affect primes you to move somehow. Right. And we have these different uh, qualities of aspect we we talked about um, um, last week. So where in the, 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 the basic core self, we're going to call it the sensory motor cycle, is that affective energy arises, it moves toward perception. Perception is like, you know, in, the, in our Western tradition, we talk about perception in a very passive way, like your eyes are just receiving light and sound waves are just bouncing off your ears. This is not exactly uh, what happens. Your perceptual organs are primed by affect to go somewhere, right? They, they, they're evolved to go somewhere. So this is why, for example, um, if you are, um, you know, like phantom limb syndrome, all these things, or if you, if, you, if you do dark cave meditation and you rob your eyes of sensory stimulation, you'll start to hallucinate because they, they have an active core to them also, right? It will be primed by whatever affect is operating in you to go somewhere. And absent the world, they will you you will you can feel that aspect of sensory perception and hallucination and stuff because that's the movement toward the world. Okay, so we have to understand this is how we understand these things as a process from a process phenomenological standpoint. So. We have affective energy, then we have perception, and then that cycle, uh, it, in terms of the sensory motor core, wants to discharge as action, right? It kind of discharges the en energy, it's cathartic, and then a new, you know, these are all micro cycles, and new cycles come up. That's called the allocentric mode. The energy comes from the world. Uh, you know, your gut biome and whatever, the situation in the world through your, it stimulates your, configures your affective system, which is also part of your vagus system and your homeostasis and all of that. And then that primes perception and that discharges this action in the world. We talked about story and we can see story is the inward curving of that arc. So from affect, it doesn't get to perception. It starts to curve inward into story, into the virtualization, could be image or story, okay? And that's called the egocentric pathway. These are neurophenomenologically distinct pathways if you wanna read about them. There's this book called Zen in the Brain by James Austin. It's really excellent, it's a very big book, but uh, these two pathways, the allocentric and the egocentric pathway are distinct. They've done these perceptual uh, experiences that show, um, um, yeah, it's kind of complicated. But anyways, they're very, they're very distinct. Uh, people who have uh, brain lesions that cut off the egocentric uh, pathway can't find 
they have these mystical experiences because the egocentric pathway orients the world towards yourself. The allopathic pathway orients objects in space without reference to the self, right? So uh, mountain climbers who have hypoxia, they often have this thing called, you know, no head syndrome because they lose the egocentric pathway. And this, this notion of pointing back to yourself doesn't exist. And you have this like 360 panoramic surround perceptual uh, bleed where you and the perception uh, are one taste really, right? So th these are actually neurophenomenologically distinct. So, when, so that would be the, the curve into virtual space uh, following the egocentric pathway. And then that curving in, in uh, creates the narrative self, imputes the, the false self. That, so we have the core self and its sensory motor, uh, affect perception action cycle, and then we have the false self, which is this imputation into the virtual reality in the story. So, and then we'll get to the third mode, um, so <clears throat> when we look at lust this way, um, one of the things I said last week is lust is um, the, the, the care, the seeking, and um, the connection, the seeking, and the play mastery. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're semi-independent. Uh, they certainly interact with each other. But the lust pathway seems to not be its own thing. It seems to take all those three things and prime them for a different type of action, right? So when you think of lust, it's driven by care, right? And panic is all tied up into that. And it's driven by connection and it's driven by play and anger a lot. And it's driven by, you know, it's driven by, what's the third one? Fear, seeking and fear. So somehow lust catalyzes all the other affects in a, in, and complexifies the situation. The more of those that are online, the more polymorphic kind of lust you have, right? The, and so, so he, now you have the, this somehow lust has got all these things engaged toward an object, discharge an object in the world. The, it wants to meet the world, which is uh, no, okay, so let me go slower. Okay, uh, let me back up and answer this. Egocentric is affect, instead of discharging into perception, it curves into the, the mind. It curves into thought. And then you create your, it doesn't even get to perception. It's truncated at that part of the sensory motor cycle. You see people who like, uh, as I said that, uh, one week, uh, you know, I meet people who work with the horses and they're almost going to get kicked. And then I say, like, how would you know if you're in danger? And they go, well, I go inside, you know, they don't use their, they don't use their perception. This is a, this is a, a, a problem with meditation, if not done correctly, uh, we end up creating people who <laughs> are looping inside their own kind of manufactured reality forever and ever. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. These, these little questions that, you know, and these the sessions go fast and I talk fast. So um, heads up for, uh, for uh, uh, the liking system and the lust system in, um, I don't think Pan accepts says like, uh, there's care and nurture. Um, he has he he has uh, fear, play, seeking, uh, care, panic, and lust. Okay, so in terms of the neurochemistry of it, um, they're not distinct chemicals. They're distinct cocktails of those chemicals. So. Uh, if you think of being at a cocktail bar, the, the bartender only has so many things to use, but the combinations and the amounts and the, the order that they come and stuff like that will make, um, will make a different uh, um, kind of effect, okay? 
So there's actually only a handful of neurochemicals. And even those neurochemicals uh, all are built on the same molecules. So it's very fine tuned complexity out of simple rules. And we know that from complexity theory, simple rules generate complex processes. Complex rules generate complicated situations, right? So we're building on simple rules. These are all really good questions. And it's good because then we could take our time to get to lust. Um, okay, so lust would be the same thing. There's some kind of an affect energy. And what I described it as, this is my guess. I mean, doing my own neurophenomenology, it seems to me that it's not, uh, you know, it's driven by seeking. When you're lusting, the seeking drive is really on. And so is the, the care panic you know, that you can, in the, and um, the play anger is really right there, right there in the cocktail, right there in the mix. So uh, uh, does that resonate with everyone? I mean, this is why all those types of sexual experiences are there. All those, uh, you know, and then a lot of times after the sexual uh, after orgasm, they all come flooding in. The lust is gone, and then these, you know, whatever your typology is, you could start crying, or you could start, sometimes, I mean, men and women, you get really angry, right? Because there's these, these streams are somehow highlighted in, and directed by lust. You could think of lust as the, the main uh, stallion, and all, you know, he's and, he, and it, you know, normally all the herd is just eating, doing their things. Then the main stallion starts to drive them all. There's something like that that everything comes online, and your perception comes online. Um, you know, um, more too. Everything is heightened, right? So you, your poly, your um, your eyes. You might find yourself staring at certain parts of the body. Uh, your smell, which is usually pretty passive, comes online. Um, um, taste is really activated. Um, the desire, the oral desire in your mouth is highly activated. All these things. So this, again, is affect coming in and priming the perceptual organs. And what the way I just described it, the, the perceptual organs there's different perceptual organs that are usually passive in our society that come online, like the or you know the mouth obviously, the genitals obviously, your earlobes, all these little points that are no, usually just kind of like chill, right? So somehow it also primes different. At so now we can start to look at um, our body as having is part of the perceptual organs, right? These, these little places we all know of some know more of them than others. And you start to see that there's a polymorphic kind of perceptual field uh, that is activated with lust um, that is not so much activated uh, by the other affect streams. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. So um, that's one thing. The other thing we want to look at, in, first in terms of the, no, the, the other, the normal, the non-lustful, the virtuous affects, if you're a Catholic, versus the sinful ones, <laughs> is um, all affects also have something called, um, an another way to put it, I called it affect, perception, and action. The other way we can look at it that's part of this is desire, duration, and satisfaction. Now this touches on, uh, what's a hot question? What did she ask? Wait, I gotta go to this. Sexually turned on by ideas. Uh, yes. Uh, what's that called? Sapiosexual. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're just working with the, we're gonna go into Tantra at the end of this and I think we'll get into that. Uh, uh, then when we go from Tantra to just ideas. Uh, yeah, um, those are all downward causation and then there's something else. Okay, so 
um, we're on our way there to answering that. So we can also look at this as desire, duration, and satisfaction. Now, Rob Brubea's work, um, he, this is what he's trying to get at. He's trying, he's saying something like, there is, an, there is no such thing as non-attachment or not desire. He's, he has a cool phrase for it that I'm not going to remember. Because he's saying that every moment of perception is actually a desire. Okay, so it's like a desire. False lust is uh, fetishism. Okay, so uh, that and and we can talk about that. Uh, let's see, let me let me make sure I get to how that works. Um, so you know, and he 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 he's working in this realm where he's noticing that even every act of perception has desire in it, and that has to do with this notion of wanting to go somewhere, being primed to meet the world, right? So the, the so um, um, if you start paying attention, uh, you notice like if you're kind of letting your eyes wander outside in nature, there's certain greens that feel like, whoa, that really satisfied my eyes. Like you can start to feel the subtle, movement of perception towards satisfaction. And we don't experience this very well because all our language and the way we talk about our sexual, our sexual organs are, which you could, we could might as well say, like our perceptual organs are sexual organs because they all work the same way. There's desire that seeks satisfaction. Uh, same with sound. If you're listening to Mozart was great at this, Bach even better. He, he could set up a symphony so you were dying for a certain tone that he wouldn't give you and he wouldn't give you and he wouldn't give you until finally gives you. There's great books written about the, the, this technique and uh, when he wrote one of his symphonies, I can't remember, it might be the, uh, uh, the, Easter, the Easter one. It, the choir goes on and on and on for like, 45 minutes at the end and you're just dying for the resolution and then he slightly changes the pitch to a fifth and then this and that. When he first showed that, there was a riot because people thought it was too sexual. It's the same thing. It's too sexual. It's this the desire, then the duration, this is the tantra, and then the satisfaction of the desire. Okay, and all perception is like this. I just showed you that music is, it's all like this. Um, so, um, um, so lust isn't different than that. It's just that the object of satisfaction is specific um, in certain sense. Uh, you know, we, we're trying to talk about the bones of this, but the objects of satisfaction is specific and it's, and it's all across the board. I mean, there are people who, you know, there's, I forget what the name of it. Um, there are people who are zoo, you know, their object of satisfaction are animals. There are people who are like falling in love with machines, like, and it's really sexual. Uh, that I don't understand. I don't understand where the imagistic, uh, you know, how, how, it, this is this is same thing with homosexuality. How the object of that uh, it, is set in the mind. I don't I don't know that. But some but it's all, but you know it's there's many many uh, uh, varieties of what the the object that creates a satisfaction is um, in in lust, just like in sound and stuff like that. So. Um, so then we have, um, <clears throat> so then we have, so the egocentric mode, uh, um, which doesn't mean you masturbate. We're talking about the e egocentric mode is when it turns into a, into a, a story. Okay. So that's something else. Cause if you masturbate, you can make the object where they called auto eroticism, uh, auto erotic homosexuality or transgender, that's ContraPoints talks about it like that. Um, that's different than imagining, 
you know, someone uh, using an imagination and masturbating because that that is is the object of it is still this other object. Okay. Uh, then we can go on to Tantra, but let me see what questions look appropriate here. Uh, yeah, there is a book about this black manipulating thing. I, I wrote, I, I wrote it, I read it a long time ago. Um, I, if I find it, I'll send it off to Peter. Um, 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 or just, you know, if I can find the music, I have it here. I think it's his, uh, his, uh, um, what is it right there? Anyways, um, I'll, I'll find what music it is. Uh, um, yeah, Robert Bear died recently. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so desiring to know is something in this action perception perception cycle. Okay, so Tantra. <clears throat> so Tantra obviously is not curving the desire into a thought and worrying or whatever, or having some kind of mental masturbation, but it's holding open the duration between the desire and the object. It's just living in this. So those of you who did my course, it's still hunting. Right? You just still hunt for awe as long as you can. And if you do this with another person, um, the energies um, cohere, become resonant and coherent in a way which this increases the energy. Of course, uh, this is something that uh, people only have a certain capacity, you know, your nervous system, uh, your the neurodynamics, you have to build capacity for this. Um, um, and while you're doing that, um, you're also vulnerable to, in, in, in Qigong, they call it a uh, microcosmic orbit. Um, uh, you're vulnerable to uh, 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 upwelling these other kinds of uh, emotional content because all those other affect streams are also searching for satisfaction. So you're holding all this open and, and you know, wants a story or wants some, you know, so it's, it, it can be like detoxifying because if you can, if you can maintain it because you're, you're cleansing out all the available objects that can cathex, as Freud would say, the energy until you can just have free flow energy. And because for lust, it heightens all of those. Um, if you have something in your care connection or fear or panic, then, then that will tend to present itself uh, in Tantra. Um, <clears throat> so it's about expanding this duration. That's different than fetishism. Fetishism is projecting that on an object of desire and then telling you you can't have it. That creates a different type of um, attachment or pursuit that has to do with um, uh, uh, psychological uh, incoherence. It's very similar to uh, those, those experiments they did a long time ago with with rats, where if you randomize when they get shocked, you get you go crazy. So um, fetishism is kind of like that. It's it's because it's a double bind. It's it's increasing your desire for something and saying you're not allowed to have it at the same time. Uh, but then you're a passive kind of being manipulated in that. This is different than being an active participant in holding open the duration of your desire. Um, yeah. Now, <clears throat> the interesting thing about all of this is that, um, If you hold open the duration of that desire, 
long enough. Something rather marvelous can happen. And to talk about that, I first want to go uh, um, give a, uh, uh, go over use a, a, a few more terminology so we can understand this without too much complexity. Um, so um, um, if you look at any kind of perception, so the affective energy is going to come up and then it's going to drive perception in this allocentric mode. If you look at any kind of perception, you see something very interesting, and that is um, there, there's a subject object shift in the neurophenomenology of, of, of perception when you look really closely. So, for example, I'll make it very easy. If I'm uh, making a soup and I'm putting in different spices and I'm not, I'm just smelling it, you know, I'm smelling it. So I'm smelling something that's qualia, right? That's subjective experience. But if I look and look and look and look at what's happening, pretty soon I'm talking about the molecular structure of cinnamon or coriander. And that sounds like the world. That sounds like object, right? So when we investigate this way that language makes it too hard to cut, we realize that subjective perception bleeds into world seamlessly. Now in between what we call qualia of subjective content phenomenon and world where it gets very uh, tricky, which is which I call the hylozoic zone. Hylozoism is a terminology from uh, sustainable architecture where they make, for example, building blocks that have semi-living components so they self-heal. So the hylozoic is something that's not necessarily objective or alive, you know, it's this kind of intermediate zone. It's the same thing, for example, with your balance. Feeling balanced, feeling dizzy, feeling um, tipsy, all of these things having vertigo depend upon mechanisms in your inner ear. And it depends upon these little, these little uh, crystals of calcium that sit atop the cilia and they move in the saddle of your middle ear. Now, the calcium, calcium, when I say that term calcium, and then I could say, I forget what it is, it may, you know, I could give you the formula. That sounds like a part piece of the world. It's, it's the same stuff in the rock. So when we look at what is the perceptual organ, what is the perceptual organ of taste? It, it's not, confined to my mouth. It's the whole entire thread from mouth to world and back again. Right? This is why uh, Goethe said every thing correctly seen opens a new organ of perception because it's a new thread through the world. Uh, Gibson's theory, ecological theory of perception uh, talks about this uh, really well. It's kind of complicated, but so the highlight. So what we're saying is that every organ of perception that is not contained. It, 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 you get beyond seeing perception of having a subject-object quality. When you hold open the duration of satisfaction, this becomes very clear. Um, it, it, it's a kind of satore where you can't tell if the world is like, for example, seeing you or you're seeing the world. And it's because you've lost the illusion that there is separateness, that perception and the world are separate. Um, 
you can experience the molecules gifting you the, the, the way they taste versus I'm tasting the soup. I mean, there becomes, uh, agency becomes omnidirectional. Everything becomes animated. Everything is, without the world, I could not see. Um, so, um, <clears throat> There is an aspect, there's, there's an aspect of Tantra where you can drive lust to the same place instead of into an object that, uh, uh, that satisfies uh, into um, this experience of the world as vital eros, some people say. People make too much make it sound too much like a platonic ideal. Um, um, the creative force, um, you see that that's in the world. It's not, it's not in you. Um, and then, you know, you can resurrect your, your relationship to it. Are there any where where does what do we are there any questions? I mean, they could be you know, uh, they could be specific questions. Maybe had a really good question. Maybe you want to go off mute. Maybe ask it to Benita. You're you're on, you're on mute still. You're off mute now. There we go. <laughs> uh, I feel like you might have addressed it um, a lot uh, already with this false lust, but maybe you could go um, a little bit into more how the commodification of sex and like the mediation of sex through all of these kind of consumer um, contexts uh, maybe increases the amount of fetishization that we have and steers us away from tantric practice. Yeah. So let's talk about um, another simple uh, set of words we can use, and then I'll ask you questions. In doing this work, uh, um, the question is what's online and what's offline? So if you imagine uh, the situation you're describing, a fetish, I have a fetish for something. When someone's having that experience what's online is there a story online is there a cultural structure online is there uh, early attachment uh, psychological structures online so these are all egocentric forms these are all curving into the mind before it goes into action right so um <clears throat> Now, it's, that's, so, and again, it's what's online, what's offline, what sequence, uh, maybe we could talk about states next time. I have a really cool way to uh, uh, figure out the different state experiences across all the traditions. But, so what's online and what's offline is very important, right? So is your sense of self online or offline? Is there a thought, a story, a narrative subtly in there? All, but also the sequence. So if I, you know, you know, if I see someone with a cigar and it makes me think of a phallus, it's not clear which came first. It's not clear that like, first I'm like, the guy's like sexy and then I project that onto the cigar. So the order in which these micro kind of cycles come is also important. You know, um, for me, I know that, um, uh, in the in most cases, things like sexual jokes and these little ways we are usually comes from that the body's already uh, excited. 
uh, and then you don't you just don't see those things. They don't provoke you in the same way. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's usually you know the other the other direction when you see that that uh, famous uh, sequence with um, Groucho Marx. The little housewife, she comes up and he's like, he's got her already, you know, or, or who's great at this, Russell Brand talking to those news people. Like that's operating already. So they can hard, she can hardly, she doesn't even want to talk because all she can think of are sexual things to say and she doesn't want to say them. So that order is, is um, upward causation, right? Versus, uh, something that because cultural or thought or some experience downwardly causes me to be aroused and there's no sensory motor action cycle in that. That's, I mean, these still are natural phenomenon for humans, but it's not, um, it's not this more kind of like uh, uh, um, natural order of things. Yeah, there's a Russell, a Russell brand, Who's he talking to? That woman, that woman broadcaster with the oh, Morning Joe, I think. He comes on and he's just like, yeah. I love watching him work, work people like that, like that. You know, I mean. Uh, Is there anything else? So yeah, so this notion of what's online and what's offline and the order in which they appear. Uh, and that can answer your question about sapio, what is it called, sapio? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I apologize if I'm breaking the protocol here. I'm, un I'm unmuting myself because I, I put it in chat, but I don't think it was noticed. Um, thank you, Bonnie. This is very illuminating. I was very curious about that curve and um, the nature of the overlap between perceptual systems and, and, synesth and synesthesia is the overlaps between the visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic, taste and touch. It's not obvious how this happens and many different sensorium uh, process in very different ways. Um, a touch for some persons is so acute, they can see somebody um, have an experience and they can register it in a very robust way in their, in the interior. So I think it's that nature of the, of your, uh, of what you said, the resurrection of your relationship. Um, to lust, something like lust, uh, and the nature of the of the poetic imagination. And I can only do this with a story, actually, because it's only in metaphor and story that I can translate adequately to other people what's going on. For instance, when I was in college, we studied Racine's Phaedra. Uh, it's a it's a tragedy. It's about a young woman with a married to an older man, very powerful, and it's a unequal relationship and she falls in love with her husband's son yeah and we know what happens so, next. Yeah. it's a tragic let me, event yeah let me just um i don't think let you were here about, yeah yeah but, but okay i don't think you were here on the first one this is a series of what called source code analysis we're trying to get to simple powerful protocols and not complex stories so the story well, of i seen well, is really complex but you should read this book by Harry Hunt called The Nature of Consciousness. I, ha I have read that book. Yeah, yeah. So I know that well. Um, he, I, he's undervalued in terms of his relationship to that notion of synesthesia. So yeah, if your comment could be, what, are, what is the core protocols okay. in the story? Not the story why, itself. Okay. Why do I, when the teacher asked, does anyone identify with Theadra and her lust for her Mm -hmm. I did, I yeah. did strongly identify with theatria, even though, I, but as a gay man, I lusted for a lot of people that I could not have. So I identified with that at that level, but I did not say yes. 
I do identify with Beatria because of the social setting I was in. And nobody rose their hand. Nobody identified with Theatria, which I found mm. very remarkable. <laughs> you know? And no one could identify with this character. Yeah. So that's the question I'm having about resurrection. How can we, through art and through the imagination, create a kind of resurrection so that these kinds of loops do not torment us and do not fragment us, but actually augment yeah. or elaborate um, certain kinds of tensions that we then can modify, modulate, just as uh, Bach did in his music. So I hope some of that made sense. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, like people always have in the West have always argued that, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, when you take those kind of primal energies, you turn them into art, uh, sublimation. Um, there's a movie with uh, Diane Keaton and Jack Nicholson, perfect, popular. People have always argued that sublimation, without sublimation, you wouldn't have the great art. This does not ring true uh, for like indigenous people. You know, for them, it's like there would, there's too much messiness in it. But this is not a place to argue that. But that's where I would say that question lives. And it's a, it's a, fan, a, a fantastic question. Any thoughts on this way? This maps onto experience of child sexual abuse. Um, so what we're trying to sh talk about is um, the sensory motor action cycle of percep of, of these these affects, lust being the same one. Um, in their flow state, they can either discharge as action, affect perception and action or you can open the duration and they, they flow, you get the sense of flow, in and Yang's term, you just feel the energy itself. It's not suppressed, it's not dissatisfied, it starts to uh, create its own kind of tantric cycle. Um, if, the, the way I understand, and now I'm out of my league here, uh, but the way I understand sexual abuse is that, again, most of these traumas are double bind. Uh, double bind um, is in, in the sense that um, there's something that arises naturally and um, you're put in a double bind situation. So uh, the natural fear of abuse is arising with the same uh, need for the parent to protect you, let's say. So you're in a double bind. And both these, both these are completely authentic. Neither of these uh, experiences in the child are made up. So the double binds at the level of the authentic self, you have to choose between something that's authentic in yourself. Uh, the same with uh, like, you know, it still goes on in parts of the world, but same with young people who um, and especially in my generation, we're homosexuals. The homosexual, uh, um, the object of desire arises naturally, right? And yet the culture is saying no. So this builds shame. The difference between shame and guilt is shame is the cultural, when something that is authentic in you is uh, rejected. Uh, whereas guilt is, you kind of know you broke the rules and you'll, you can take the hit for it, right? So um, um, shame, that's why shame's hard to work with because it's nature. You, you, you're asked to uh, be skeptical about something that authentically arises. That might be part of what you were saying, John, you know, like uh, the silence might have said, nah, how could you, how could you identify with that? Um, now, because of this way in which lust seems to tie into all these other categories, um, it can couple with rage, let's say, or couple with anger, or couple with panic, um, you, you know, whatever energy, when it, those, those streams are highlighted. And if you have an energy signature, uh, which could have been set in early childhood by your relationship with your parents, might have been, they may have been angry people, you might have 
the, the, the anger might have been coupled with uh, uh, affection or lust. Um, yeah, all these things start to build complexity. Um, I don't know, did I, did I help or make that worse? The future is really should be lust in its analgesic function in the face of social loss. Oh, that's a great question. Can, can, do you, can you talk around that question, uh, Ali? Yeah, yeah, um, that's something I want to learn, uh, research more about. Like, from what I've been reading, um, lust is not mediated uh, by uh, dopamine, DA. Like you said, it's separate from the seeking system, but it uses the seeking system uh, along with other systems in, in some sense. And, um, and these are ancient brain molecules and uh, they're thought to have evolved uh, initially for pleasure but then they uh, came to later um, to be used for analgesic purposes in face of social um, loss from what I have read. Uh, and we know this because lust follows the panic uh, grief affect. And, um, and this is compared to um, opioids in some ways. And um, some scholars uh, hands say lust is dangerous in this aspect because it replaces things. Uh, so the reward is in replacing things as opposed to uh, the reward being in the chase. So that's... Yeah. So I just have a question for you. By analgesic, do you mean like spaced out and, or do you mean like um, content? And, just and just to re relieve pain. Just the, to relieve the basic, pain. Okay. Basic sense of the word. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of things. I think you know this already. I'll just lay it out. Um, the seeking system um, is uh, you don't get your hit of dopamine when you find what you're seeking for. You get it at the at the height of anticipation the anticipatory aspect. This is, and this is related to this tantric, but learning how to become the perfect seeker, the duration of the seeking is held out without an object. You accept the desire and the movement toward, but you keep the duration open for as long as possible. Um, and, um, well, I would suspect that opioids kill your sex drive. Do it, does it? Or, I mean, eventually, you know, some of these things. Um, um, yeah, it's interesting to figure out what the, uh, yeah, I can't talk to the neuropharmacology of opioid um, abuse. I haven't experienced it. Um, yeah, it'd be in it's an interesting question. And of course, these things have different, you know, different uh, effects on different people, what they, what they exacerbate, what they take offline, what they uh, amplify, what they diminish in your system. Uh, I always thought it was interesting uh, when I was a kid, younger person, uh, how the different alcohols could have such different effects when it's just alcohol. You know, some would make you kind of like lazy and chill and some would make me really like, like, I mean, I can't, I can't drink martinis anymore, but when I lived in the city, you know, we, it would just make me really like sharp and energized, right? Uh, so we, so I think it would, might might be different across different uh, opioids, certainly across different people. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'm kind of spacing out on it because I'm so angry at the old people who invented opioid and um, um, how little meaning our, our culture makes around it, 
how little attention it gets and who suffers from it. Um, yeah, kind of distracted by that, sorry. Uh, let's see, there's a question here. Can you say more about double binds? Yeah, so double binds is actually very important. It's again, if you're working, you know, working with these simple protocols, doesn't it doesn't answer everything, but it gives you a strong understanding of a lot of things. Uh, um, Wilbur early on wrote about um, the the commonality of a double bind in psychopathologies um, and double bind is um, um, there's many different forms but it's when uh, you're receiving information and they're contradicting each other it's more it's and so um, you are uh, like the parent might be saying i love you but they're raping you or uh after they rape you they say something nice and you start to i mean a, 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 um, um, a response to this is dissociation you don't know where to be wh which there is no re real real reality there's no way to uh gauge which is a reality um and uh, so people dissociate from their body because the body is actually part of why it's it's uh, a double bind because the body is online saying something. No, no, this is real, and then the world is saying something else. And um, uh, yeah, um, there. And then there's millions of small ways in our society that we set up double binds all the time. Um, and we mostly do it with <clears throat> what's called performative contradiction. Someone's body saying the opposite of what they're telling you. Uh, we most, so people, this is why a lot of times, uh, even on Facebook threads, but in collective insight practice, when things are getting heated, I'll say, don't pay attention to the words. The words are just cathartic uh, uh, action. Like at a certain point, just stop paying attention to the words. Um, get and and try to get down to what's really happening first by trusting your body, um, and um, that's one way to avoid double binds. Um, it's very frustrating. I, I know. I think Prady is going to agree with me here. When you're in a social situation and it's so clear to you that someone's bullshitting and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're just like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, it's like, and then you realize what's online for people. It's just communicative uh, transactions. There's perceptions and there. Um, I had a very interesting experience once with a member of my family who'd gotten into not a, a, a gang of people who were not nice. He was like a grifter, a ripoff artist. And then they, she got my mother involved and they came over to our house one day, which I was really mad at because I lived at the time in a little, tiny little house, I, isolation, I didn't want these people to know where I lived. But this grifter, it was like everything you asked him, he was just, yeah, like my, we would talk about my nephew was a good baseball player. He's like, yeah, yeah, I know this guy is a baseball player. And this person's, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, like everything was like, like he was so good at everything. Everything was so, he had so many cool things to talk about. And I'm just like, he's just a grifter. And my family was really mad at me, you know? Uh, same thing in business when you could tell people, I'm like, She's, ex she's, she's stealing from you, so obvious. How could she be stealing from us? She's like the nicest worker in the, it's you know so clear. So uh, there's a lot of this going in our society. Our society is so like fucked up. 
Um, so if you experience society about that, what I'm here to reflect back to you is that that's what's real. So you're really seeing the reality and um, yeah. If I could ask a follow-up, Benita, um, what are some of the ways that double binds resolve themselves um, either in a good or constructive way or in a bad or destructive way? Um, so I don't know if you're going to like this answer. I don't even like it right now, but it came up and it's like, just say it, Bonnie. <laughs> um, uh, you have to stop complexifying things. Like I've worked with people that go around and around and around or where I used to work about their boss. And I'm like, he's an asshole. That's all. I mean, the guy's an asshole. Once you just see him as an asshole, you can just deal with it. It's like, don't try to fix it. Don't get like, like there's too much complexity in our psyches. Like there's too much, we can, somebody uh, talked about Caesar Roma, the guy who works with the dog whisperer, you know? Like so much, we, we could get 90% of this done by understanding our animal nature and doing, doing it well. And so like, um, yeah, there's just, uh, or Jordan Hall will say, you know, there's too much bullshit thinking. So how do you fix it? You don't fix it. It's like, oh, you just, you ignore it. Like, this is the other thing. We're, we're always walking toward, uh, when people work with the horses and they're starting to get like antsy, the horses walk away. And a person will say, why is the horse walking away? And I'm like, because the energy is toxic. So they leave. What do people do? When the energy is toxic on Facebook, that's where we go. That, it's like crazy because we are crazy. We're in this double bind. Um, you know, and then the opposite happens. I'll do coaching sessions with two people in relationship don't like each other. And I'll have a horse in the barn and they're sitting there just looking at each other. The horse is packed over in the corner wanting to get out. And then little by little, as their hearts melt, the horse will come in and put himself right in the middle of those two people sitting there. And they'll say, why did the horse do that? And I said, because they like sweet energy. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. Use your complexity of your mind for interesting, creative things, like John said. Don't get all like fucked up in this drama of psychoactive psychotic and sociopathic people, which is who we are. And so, you know, be like a horse, walk towards sweet energy and just walk away from toxic shit. That's 90% of it. Good question. That's my best answer. <laughs> I mean, that's how I live my life. Uh, yeah. And it's, you know, it's what's interesting is this is part, and now I'm going to get even more in trouble. This is part of the message that the right is trying to tell you. Now, they don't have it worked out either, but some of this sense of just, you know, not overcomplexifying things is, is kind, of, kind of a postmodern problem. Uh, you can make a double bind by trying, in your own self, by trying to fix a double bind, right? Uh, now, a lot of times, you then you say, well, why can't I walk away from it? And then you'll find that you probably have an inward curve and a story and a narrative, uh, maybe some psychological, unresolved psychological material or something. But so it's easier said than done. But once you get the habit of it, uh, yeah, you don't want to walk away until it's time to walk away. But if it's time to walk away, you just walk away from it. And yeah. Are, are there any therapeutic techniques that you can better understand? Like, ah, that's how it works based on this. Like you kind of walk away or ignore it. Yeah. So what you have to do is experiment. There's no one's going to tell you, be able to help you uh, move in this direction. So you experiment in ways that feel risky, uh, but you know are safe. Like uh, it's interesting because and on June 1st, I'm going to leave Facebook, deactivate my account. And I can feel this is risky or this is distasteful to me, you know? So it's an experiment. I mean, 
I know that the way my mind, like so today, Daniel Schmattenberger invites me on Facebook to a secret group. And I'm like, oh man, I'm hanging on Facebook. Like I can feel all these like, you know, but I'm going to walk away because I don't, I can't answer the question until I try. And I know that the risk I feel is actually kind of silly. I mean, from my intellectual standpoint. Um, so um, you look for things like that. You know, you look for opportunities. If you got a bullshit job and you're kind of feeling like leaving anyways, instead of leaving, you could push, push it close to the needle to where you're gonna get fired and then maybe you don't walk away or you just walk away. You know, these, these things are uh, uh, better resolved by trying little experiments. Um, uh, uh, interrupt your normal habit of responding or engaging. Um, yeah. Okay, Peter. Bonita. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're coming back next week, same time, same channel. <sighs> I guess. <laughs> oh yes, because um, we want to talk about the imagination. I didn't have any ideas of what to do, but some of you talked about the imagination, and we could do my states, uh, my states, my little states source code too. All the different states of the Yanas and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Great. It's not that I don't want to come back. I just, uh, you know, I, but you know, now I've got some idea of what we could do that is interesting to interesting to the audience. So. Mm -hmm. One week at a time. <laughs> uh, do you want to close out? Do you want me to close out? No, you, can you close out? Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Bonita. Thank you, everyone. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, a bunch of events coming up uh, today. I think like four lined up. You can just check out the website, the store.ca. Um, one coming up at 12 p.m. Eastern time is Rhea Bach's uh, Collective Presence thing, which is really, really good uh, if you haven't checked it out yet. Um, yeah, just uh, go to the website, sign up for listserv, and uh, check out the gift economy. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, have a good weekend.